Section 16 of The Captain of the Pole Star and Other Tales by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Huxford's Hiatus, Part 2. The acceptance was duly dispatched, and John Huxford began immediately to prepare for his departure, for the Montreal firm had intimated that the vacancy was a certainty, and that the chosen man might come out without delay to take over his duties. In a very few days his scanty outfit was completed, and he started off in a coasting vessel for Liverpool, where he was to catch the passenger ship for Quebec. Remember, John, Mary whispered, as he pressed her to his heart upon the brisk port quay, the cottage is our own, and come what may, we have always that to fall back on. If things should chance to turn out badly over there, we have always a roof to cover us. There you will find me until you send word to us to come. And that will be very soon, my lass, he answered cheerfully, with a last embrace. Goodbye, Granny, goodbye. The ship was a mile and more from the land before he lost sight of the figures of the straight, slim girl and her older companion, who stood watching and waving to him from the end of the gray stone quay. It was with a sinking heart and a vague feeling of impending disaster that he saw them at last as minute specks in the distance, walking townward and disappearing among the crowd who lined the beach. From Liverpool, the old woman and her granddaughter received a letter from John, announcing that he was just starting in the bark St. Lawrence, and six weeks afterwards, a second longer epistle informing them of his safe arrival at Quebec, and gave them his first impression of the country. After that, a long, unbroken silence set in. Week after week and month after month passed by, and never a word came from across the seas. A year went over their heads, and yet another, but no news of the absentee. Sheridan and Moore were written to, and replied that though John Huxford's letter had reached them, he had never presented himself, and they had been forced to fill up the vacancy as best they could. Still Mary and her grandmother hoped against hope, and looked out for the letter carrier every morning, with such eagerness that the kind-hearted man would often make a detour, rather than pass the two pale, anxious faces which peered at him from the cottage window. At last, Three years after the young foreman's disappearance, old Granny died, and Mary was left alone, a broken, sorrowful woman, living as best she might on a small annuity which had descended to her, and eating her heart out as she brooded over the mystery which hung over the fate of her lover. Among the shrewd West Country neighbors, there had long, however, ceased to be any mystery in the matter. Huxford arrived safely in Canada, so much was proved by his letter. Had he met with his end in any sudden way, during the journey between Quebec and Montreal, there must have been some official inquiry, and his luggage would have sufficed to have established his identity. Yet the Canadian police had been communicated with, and had returned a positive answer, that no inquest had been held, or any body found, which could by any possibility be that of the young Englishman. The only alternative appeared to be that he had taken the first opportunity to break all the old ties and had slipped away to the backwoods or to the States to commence life anew under an altered name. Why he should do this, no one professed to know, but that he had done it appeared only too probable from the facts. Hence, Many a deep growl of righteous anger rose from the brawny smacksman when Mary, with her pale face and sorrow-sunken head, passed along the quays on her way to her daily marketing. And it is more likely that if the missing man had turned up in Brisport, he might have met with some rough words or rougher usage, unless he could give some very good reason for his strange conduct. This popular view of the case never, however, occurred to the simple trusting heart of the lonely girl, and as the years rolled by, her grief and her suspense were never for an instant tinged with a doubt as to the good faith of the missing man. 
From youth she grew into middle age, and from that into the autumn of her life, patient, long-suffering, and faithful, doing good as far as lay in her power, and waiting humbly until fate should restore either in this world or the next that which it had so mysteriously deprived her of. In the meantime, neither the opinion held by the minority that John Huxford was dead, nor that of the majority, which pronounced him to be faithless, represented the true state of the case. Still alive and of stainless honor, he had yet been singled out by fortune as her victim in one of those strange freaks which are of such rare occurrence and so beyond the general experience that they might be put by as incredible, had we not the most trustworthy evidence of their occasional possibility. Landing at Quebec with his heart full of hope and courage, John selected a dingy room in a back street, where the terms were less exorbitant than elsewhere, and conveyed hither the two boxes which contained his worldly goods. After taking up his quarters there, he had half a mind to change again, for the landlady and her fellow lodgers were by no means to his taste. But the Montreal coach started within a day or two, and he consoled himself by the thought that the discomfort would only last for that short time. Having written home to Mary to announce his safe arrival, he employed himself in seeing as much of the town as was possible, walking about all day and returning to his room at night. It happened, however, that the house on which the unfortunate youth had pitched was one which was notorious for the character of its inmates. He had been directed to it by a pimp, who found regular employment in hanging about the docks and decoying newcomers to this den. The fellow's specious manner and proffered civility had led the simple-hearted West Countrymen into the toils, and though his instinct told him that he was in unsafe company, he refrained, unfortunately, from at once making his escape. He contented himself with staying out all day and associating as little as possible with the other inmates. From the few words which he did let drop, however, the landlady gathered that he was a stranger without a single friend in the country to inquire after him should misfortune overtake him. The house had an evil reputation for the hocusing of sailors, which was done not only for the purpose of plundering them, but also to supply outgoing ships with crews, the men being carried on board insensible, and not coming to until the ship was well down the St. Lawrence. This trade caused the wretches who followed it to be experts in the use of stupefying drugs, and they determined to practice their arts upon their friendless lodger so as to have an opportunity of ransacking his effects, and of seeing what it might be worth their while to purloin. During the day, he invariably locked his door and carried off the key in his pocket, but if they could render him insensible for the night, they could examine his boxes at their leisure, and deny afterwards that he had ever brought with him the articles which he missed. It happened, therefore, Upon the eve of Huxford's departure from Quebec, that he found, upon returning to his lodgings, that his landlady and her two ill-favored sons, who assisted her in her trade, were waiting up for him over a bowl of punch, which they cordially invited him to share. It was a bitterly cold night, and the fragrant steam overpowered any suspicions which the young Englishman may have entertained. So he drained off a bumper, and then, retiring to his bedroom, threw himself upon his bed without undressing, and fell straight into a dreamless slumber, in which he still lay when the three conspirators crept into his chamber, and having opened his boxes, began to investigate his effects. It may have been that the speedy action of the drug caused its effect to be evanescent, or perhaps that the strong constitution of the victim threw it off with unusual rapidity. Whatever the cause, it is certain that John Huxford suddenly came to himself and found the foul trio squatted round their booty, which they were dividing into two categories of what was of value and should be taken, and what was valueless and might therefore be left. 
With a bound, he sprang out of bed, and seizing the fellow nearest him by the collar, he slung him through the open doorway. His brother rushed at him, but the young Devonshire man met him with such a facer that he dropped in a heap upon the ground. Unfortunately, the violence of the blow caused him to overbalance himself, and tripping over his prostrate antagonist, he came down heavily upon his face. Before he could rise, the old hag sprang upon his back and clung to him, shrieking to her son to bring the poker. John managed to shake himself clear of them both, but before he could stand on his guard, he was felled from behind by a crashing blow from an iron bar, which stretched him senseless upon the floor. "'You've hit too hard, Joe,' said the old woman, looking down at the prostrate figure. "'I heard the bone go.' "'If I hadn't fetched him down, he'd have been too many for us,' said the young villain sulkily. "'Still you might have done it without killing him, clumsy,' said the mother. She had had a large experience of such scenes, and knew the difference between a stunning blow and a fatal one. "'He's still breathing,' the other said, examining him. "'The back of his head's like a bag of dice, though. The skull's all splintered. He can't last. What are we to do?' He'll never come to himself again, the other brother remarked. Serve him right. Look at my face. Let's see, mother, who's in the house. Only four drunk sailors. They wouldn't turn out for any noise. It's all quiet in the street. Let's carry him down a bit, Joe, and leave him there. He can die there, and no one think the worst of us. Take all the papers out of his pocket, then, his mother suggested. They might help the police to trace him. His watch, too, and his money. Three pounds odd. Better than nothing. Now carry him softly and don't slip. Kicking off their shoes, the two brothers carried the dying man downstairs and along the deserted street for a couple of a hundred yards. There they laid him among the snow, where he was found by the night patrol, who carried him on a shutter to the hospital. He was duly examined by the resident surgeon, who bound up the wounded head, but gave it as his opinion that the man could not possibly live for more than twelve hours. Twelve hours passed, however, and yet another twelve, but John Huxford still struggled hard for his life. When at the end of three days he was found to be still breathing, the interest of the doctors became aroused at his extraordinary vitality, and they bled him, as the fashion was in those days, and surrounded his shattered head with ice bags. It may have been on account of these measures, or it may have been in spite of them, but at the end of a week's deep trance, the nurse in charge was astonished to hear a gabbling noise, and to find the stranger sitting upon the couch and staring about him with wistful, wandering eyes. The surgeons were summoned to behold the phenomenon, and warmly congratulated each other upon the success of their treatment. "'You've been on the brink of the grave, my man,' said one of them, pressing the bandaged head back onto the pillow. "'You must not excite yourself. What is your name?' "'No answer, save a wild stare. Where do you come from?' Again, no answer. "'He is mad,' one suggested, or a foreigner,' said another. "'There were no papers on him when he came in.' His linen is marked J.H. Let us try him in French and German. They tested him with as many tongues as they could muster among them, but were compelled at last to give the matter over and to leave their silent patient, staring up wild-eyed at the whitewashed hospital ceiling. For many weeks John lay in the hospital, and for many weeks efforts were made to gain some clue as to his antecedents, but in vain. He showed, as the time rolled by, not only by his demeanor, but also by the intelligence, with which he began to pick up fragments of sentences, like a clever child learning to talk, that his mind was strong enough in the present, though it was a complete blank as to the past. The man's memory of his whole life, before the fatal blow, was entirely and absolutely erased. He neither knew his name, his language, his home, his business, nor anything else. The doctors held learned consultations upon him, and discoursed upon the center of memory, 
and depressed tables, deranged nerve cells, and cerebral congestions. But all their polysyllables began and ended at the fact that the man's memory was gone, and that it was beyond the power of science to restore it. During the weary months of his convalescence, he picked up reading and writing. But with the return of his strength came no return of his former life. England, Devonshire, Brisport, Mary, Granny, the words brought no recollection to his mind. All was absolute darkness. At last he was discharged, a friendless, tradeless, penniless man, without a past and with very little to look to in the future. His very name was altered, for it had been necessary to invent one. John Huxford had passed away, and John Hardy took his place among mankind. Here was a strange outcome of a Spanish gentleman's tobacco-inspired meditations. John's case had aroused some discussion and curiosity in Quebec, so that he was not suffered to drift into utter helplessness upon emerging from the hospital. A Scotch manufacturer named McKinley found him a post as a porter in his establishment, and for a long time he worked at seven dollars a week at the loading and unloading of vans. In the course of years it was noticed, however, that his memory, however defective as to the past, was extremely reliable and accurate when concerned with anything which had occurred since his accident. From the factory he was promoted into the counting house, and the year 1835 found him a junior clerk at a salary of 120 pounds a year. Steadily and surely, John Hardy fought his way upward, from post to post, with his whole heart and mind devoted to the business. In 1840, he was third clerk. In 1845, he was second. And in 1852, he became manager of the whole vast establishment, and second only to Mr. McKinley himself. There were few who grudged John his rapid advancement for it was obviously due to neither chance nor favoritism, but entirely to his marvelous powers of application and industry. From early morning until late in the night, he labored hard in the service of his employer, checking, overlooking, superintending, setting an example to all of cheerful devotion to duty. As he rose from one post to another, his salary increased, but it caused no alteration in his mode of living save that it enabled him to be more open-handed to the poor. He signalized his promotion to the managership by a donation of one thousand pounds to the hospital in which he had been treated a quarter of a century before. The remainder of his earnings he allowed to accumulate in the business, drawing a small sum quarterly for his sustenance, and still residing in the humble dwelling which he had occupied when he was a warehouse porter. In spite of his success, he was a sad, silent, morose man, solitary in his habits, and possessed always of a vague, undefined yearning, a dull feeling of dissatisfaction and of craving which never abandoned him. Often he would strive with his poor crippled brain to pierce the curtain which divided him from the past and to solve the enigma of his youthful existence. But though he sat many a time by the fire, until his head throbbed with his efforts, John Hardy could never recall the least glimpse of John Huxford's history. End of section 16